Um, so thank you. Uh, so I'm Alison Pang. I'm one of the colorectal fellows at McGill University. So today I'll be showing a transanal endoscopic approach to the management of a colorectal anastomotic stricture. Um, this was done at the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal under the guidance of Dr. Marilys Boutros. Uh, I have nothing to disclose today. So this is a case of a 60-year-old gentleman who had a low anterior resection with a diverting loop ileostomy for a locally advanced T3 N0 rectal cancer. This was done at an outside institution, and the anastomosis was located at approximately 5 centimeters from the anal verge. Now, prior to ileostomy closure, he did undergo a flexible sigmoidoscopy as well as a gastrograph and enema, both of which showed a complete obstruction at the level of the anastomosis. It was at this point that he was referred to our hospital for the management of this stricture. Now, based on his history, there had been no evidence of intra-abdominal sepsis or anastomotic leak, both of which could have caused the stricture. And we scoped him ourselves, and we biopsied the, biopsied the stricture, which came back negative for malignancy. Unfortunately, the anastomotic stricture was also too tight um, to permit balloon dilatation. So a CT scan was done, and it showed that the anastomotic stricture was short and that it had a benign appearance, as seen here on the CT scan. Now, anastomotic strictures are known complications of colorectal surgery, and their incidence is very much dependent on the circumstances of the surgery itself. Etiologies include ischemia, anastomotic leak, hemorrhage, radiation, and technical factors. The management of these anastomotic strictures include digital dilatation, the use of Hagar dil dilators, endoscopic balloon dilatation, as long as the guide wire can enter through, surgical resection and redo of the anastomosis, which means it's a transabdominal surgery, or the creation of a diverting stoma. So we used a, a transanal approach to perform a sleeve resection, and a TEO platform was, was used. So the goals of this approach was to perform a full thickness resection of the stricture, to redo the anastomosis between the new distal and proximal ends, and ultimately we really wanted to avoid an invasive transabdominal surgery. And I think it's important to note that we were comfortable approaching it in this way since all of the patient's history and clinical files would indicate that this was truly a short, um, a benign looking stricture. So uh, we first set up the TEO platform, and we used the long um, operating proctoscope. And here where the instrument is pointing is the stricture. You can tell it's very tight, and it's at the level of the anastomosis. So to begin, we used electrocautery to mark out our circumferential resection margin. We wanted to make sure that we had a good margin, which we did. We then began our resection. So we started dissecting carefully, layer by layer, circumferentially, until we reached the mesorectum. Now, we didn't dissect any further than the mesorectum, as a T TME dissection was not indicated or required for this procedure. So here you see um, us trying to dissect the stricture, stricture off of the mesorectum, and you get a sense of how tight, um, and how tight the stricture is and its shortness and length. Now, one of the challenges of the procedure was understanding when we had reached proximal to the stricture. And if I can just bring your attention to these holes right here, um, we're actually looking into um, the lumen of the proximal bowel. So at this point here, not only have we made our transection distal to the stricture, but we are now beginning um, our transection proximal to the stricture. We're using Mets and Bomb scissors here uh, since uh, cautery was sparking off of the nearby staples. So we're just uh, finishing off uh, the resection. This is just a leftover staple line that we're resecting. So once the stricture was completely resected, it was sent off to pathology. Now, this is the image we saw once the stricture had been completely resected. But before beginning to suture, we needed to make sure that the proximal end could comfortably reach the distal end, which it did, so that we could make that tension-free anastomosis. Now, if this had not been able to be done, we would have had to go intra-abdominally and mobilize the left colon, mobilize the splenic flexure further. 
So for the reconstruction, we did this all transanally, and over the next few seconds in video clips, you'll see us place first cardinal sutures using three ovicral sutures. And then we had to reapproximate all of the gaps, and we did that by placing interrupted sutures. Now, as you can see, it can be quite challenging to place multiple interrupted sutures over and over again through a transanal platform. We could have done the reconstruction by simply doing a running suture, but we felt that by doing interrupted sutures, that this would offer us the best chance at attention-free anastomosis. And in the end, by suturing in this manner, we were indeed able to complete attention-free intrarectal anastomosis. So here we are almost done um, with the anastomosis. And you'll see that there's a few gaps here that we still have to close with interrupted sutures. Up in the top of the screen, you're looking into the lumen of the proximal colon. This is just a small diverticulum proximal to the anastomosis. And then this is the complete anastomosis in the end. So the patient's post-operative course was unremarkable. He did have a repeat gastrographin enema and a flexible sigmoidoscopy prior to stoma reversal, and he indeed had his ileostomy reversed three months later with no uh, major complications. So in conclusion, a transanal endoscopic surgery is a feasible and innovative approach to the management of a short colorectal anastomotic stricture. And by approaching it in this way, we were able to avoid an invasive transabdominal surgery for this patient. Thank you.